Perhaps the most well-known and iconic images of Nazi Germany consist of massive crowds watching uniformed soldiers march by as they carried banners, banners of the swastika, culminating in a speech by Hitler to the cheering crowd of military and civilians. Nazi rallies were episodes of mass spectacle that served to highlight the power of the Nazi party, grow the cult of personality around Hitler, and increase public support for the party. The creation of massive rally grounds saw the Nazis use these events as ideal propaganda moments, move their policies forward, and show not just Germans, but the world what Hitler and Nazism stood for. In today's lecture, we're going to break down the history and uses of mass spectacles by Hitler and the Nazi party. These events were highly organized, choreographed affairs that helped showcase the ability of the Nazi party to influence Germans into following them and supporting them. These events were giant propaganda events, and Hitler knew it, and so advertised the rallies as far and wide as he could. We will look at the rituals involved in these rallies the way the architecture and design of the grounds gave the Nazis increased support, and how these events became some of the most well-known elements of the Nazi regime. While the Nazi party organized and hosted a large number of rallies and spectacles across Germany, we will be focusing on two, the annual Nuremberg rallies and the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Before examining the rallies and spectacles, it is important to understand why Hitler and the Nazi party viewed them as important. In his autobiographical political manifesto, Mein Kampf, Hitler spent time discussing the importance and how he understood the use of propaganda. Part of this discussion included his views on mass rallies and spectacles as tools for propaganda. Hitler saw these events as key to helping to build a sense of community amongst new members of the Nazi party. These events would allow individuals who were feeling isolated to be amongst like-minded individuals who supported and encouraged their views. Hitler identifies rallies as giving people a sense of support and protection, that they were with the hundreds or thousands of others who were working together and they were sheltered from the threat of outsiders. They developed an esprit de corps, but also a lowering of inhibitions as they became swept up with the crowd. Individuals were willing to go along with what everyone else was doing or cheering for, the idea of mass suggestion. By having more and more people participate in Nazi rallies, Hitler was certain that more Germans, those who originally did not support the Nazi party, would be won over to their side through the power of community building and the power of mass participation to drown out alternative political ideology. The rallies and spectacles helped to reinforce the regime by creating new rituals and traditions that everyone could see, understand, and participate in. The heavy use of symbolism and the use of ritualistic action served to reinforce the totalitarian nature of Hitler's rule as it helped Germans buy into the regime and the way they were running the country. In the span of only a few years, Hitler built a system of symbols, actions, and rituals that came to be accepted by Germans and were established to be permanent fixtures in German society. Hitler had undoubtedly developed these ideas from his own experiences, both as a member of the crowd and as the one at the head. He had attended rallies and demonstrations as a young man in Vienna that pushed German nationalism and anti-Semitism. When he became head of the German Workers' Party and rebranded them the Nazi Party, he became the face of the demonstrations in the beer halls of Bavaria and Munich. It was through the beer halls that he had hoped to gather support for the coup in 1923. The failure, though, made Hitler see the need to create larger and more encompassing rallies to garner support. The Nazi party were very active in organizing demonstrations and rallies. During the election seasons, Nazi rallies were regular features as Hitler and other leaders spoke to crowds to spread their message. As the Nazi party gained popularity in the early 1930s, their rallies grew in size. Once in power, 
the Nazi party organized a yearly calendar to celebrate major events in the history of the party and what they wanted to emphasize to Germans. Beyond the standard holidays of New Year's Day, Easter, and Christmas that the Nazis did not touch, they introduced a number of new holidays that helped to promote their ideology and set up opportunities for mass rallies. These included Heroes Memorial Day on March 16th, Hitler's birthday on April 20th, Harvest Festival Day on September 29th, and Memorial Day for the Martyrs of the Movement on November 9th. Rallies and demonstrations were held on these days annually to help push Nazi ideology across Germany. The main rally, though, was the annual Nazi Party Congress, more commonly known as the Nuremberg Rally. The purpose of the Nuremberg Rally was to serve as the annual meeting of all Nazi Party members from across Germany and often from affiliated groups in other countries. At the Congress, party members were able to celebrate the success of the party in the past year, while also planning and discussing the future of the party. The Congress allowed for Hitler to address and meet many members, as well as the general public, who were invited to attend to encourage them to join the party. The Congress was an opportunity for the Nazi party to demonstrate their strength, power, and ideology. The development of the Congress was haphazard at first. Hitler organized the first, conference, uh, first Congress on January 27, 1923, before the Beer Hall Putsch. It was hosted in Munich rather than Nuremberg, as Munich was the headquarters of the party still. After the failure of the Putsch, the Congress was put off and Hitler revived it in 1926 when they hosted the second Congress in the city of Weimar from July 3rd to 4th. At this Congress, the tradition of naming each meeting with a theme was started with this one called the Re-Founding Congress. In 1927, the third Congress was moved to Nuremberg for the first time and lasted from August 19th to the 21st. They skipped having a Congress in 1928, hosting the next in 1929. The event did not turn into an annual affair until 1933 when the fifth Congress was hosted in Nuremberg. Taking place after the Nazi seizure of power, Hitler called the meeting the Rally of Victory as it turned into a celebration of the defeat of the Weimar Republic. After 1933, the Nazi party held their Congress annually in Nuremberg at the end of August or the beginning of September. The length of the rallies grew over time with them lasting a week by 1938. The decision to host the rallies in Nuremberg was made due to practical considerations. While the first meeting was held in Munich, the city was not the most welcoming after the Beer Hall Putsch. The Nazi leader in Nuremberg, Julius Streicher, was very well organized and an effective leader. He had garnered significant support for the party in the city and had the local police under his control. As well, the city was at the time very close to the center of Germany, making it the easiest location for Nazis from across the country to reach. Once the city was established as the home of the annual Congress, the Nazi party argued that they had chosen Nuremberg due to the historic importance the city had in German history. Nuremberg for centuries had been home to the imperial diet of the Holy Roman Empire, the meeting place where the emperor would be elected and crowned. As the Nazis identified themselves as the Third Reich and the Holy Roman Empire was the First Reich, it made sense to follow in their footsteps. Nuremberg, though, was also chosen because the city had a large and open park that was very useful for holding mass rallies and event. The park, called Dutzenteich, was had been a recreational area for citizens of Nuremberg since the late 19th century. The park had several lakes that were natural but heavily controlled by the city. They were called the Grosser Dutzendeich and Kleiner Dutzendeich, Greater and Lesser. After Hitler's rise to power, he seized the park from the city and began a program of building the party rally grounds. 
Several buildings were already on site of the new rally grounds, and Nazi builders incorporated them into their plans. The first and most important structure was the Ehrenhall, the Hall of Honor. Built by the city of Nuremberg in 1930, the Ehrenhall was a war memorial to the citizens of Nuremberg who died in the First World War. Hitler saw the memorial as an important element of the grounds and used it in 1929, when it was still under construction, to honor the war dead. Not only did they honor the war dead, Hitler also used the Ehrenhall to commemorate the Nazi members killed in the Beerhall Putsch, which he cast as martyrs of the cause. The Ehrenhall became a central component in Nazi rallies as Hitler and other Nazi leaders would visit the memorial to honor the dead. Another building in the park was the Lutpold Hall. Built when the park first opened in 1906, the building was originally an exhibition hall. The Nazis used it as the meeting building for Congress discussions and was renamed the Old Congress Hall in 1935 when work began on a new building to host the Congress. The final building on the site was the Stadich Stadion, municipal stadium in the south end of the park. In this area, open fields had been created for sports games and the stadium had been built to host sporting events in 1928. The stadium was incorporated into the designs and was given over to the Hitler Youth. In the stadium, the Hitler Youth hosted their events and had sports competitions as well as their own rallies that happened during the Congress. Hitler was portrayed as the chief architect in the redesign of the park into the rally grounds, but in reality, that was actually in the hands of three architects, the brothers Ludwig and Franz Ruff and Albert Speer. The Ruff brothers had been brought on first to help redesign the park in 1933, but in 1934 they were joined by Speer, who took over the overall design and construction of the rally grounds. Speer, who we have met already in a previous lecture, impressed Hitler with his plans for the rally grounds and was brought on to help Hitler redesign Berlin. Speer saw the creation of several new meeting grounds. The first was based around the Aaron Hall that would help centralize and exaggerate the ritual of honoring the dead. Reshaping the area in front of the Aaron Hall, a crescent-shaped grandstand called Aaron Tribune, or Tribune of Honor, would be built out of stone. It was 150 meters long and could sit up to 500 people. Running from the center of the Aaron Tribune to the Aaron Hall was a 240 meter long granite path that Hitler and others would walk down. In the, field between, in the field in between, thousands of party members could stand and watch as Hitler walked to the Aaron Hall to honor the dead. The completion of the Aaron Tribune and Arena was the first completed project of the rally grounds, finished in 1934. One of the major and most iconic buildings built by Speer and the Nazis was the Zeppelin Field Grandstand. The field, part of the sports fields next to the Stadich Stadion, was named because it was used in the past as a landing spot for Zeppelins visiting Nuremberg. The field was designed by Speer in 1934 to function as the main speaking ground for Hitler and other Nazi leaders to address crowds during the rallies. To give it a sense of grandeur, Speer designed the grandstand off the Pergamon altar from ancient Greece. The grandstand was 360 meters long and was built with a massive speaker's platform in the middle that was 35 meters high. Two sets of terraces flanked the platform, rising 20 meters high. A colonnade was added as a backdrop that was another 20 meters high and had 204 flagpoles above it. A total of 70,000 spectators could sit on the terraces and hundreds of thousands could stand in the field in front of the grandstand. A massive gold swastika was placed above the hall behind the speaker's platform, which was famously destroyed in 1945 by American forces who captured it on film. In 1936, Speer and do had dozens of floodlights installed around the grandstand and at night he lit them up, 
creating the Cathedral of Light, an iconic photo of the Nuremberg rallies. Speer also designed a massive street to connect the northern end of the grounds to the southern and bisected, bisected the two lakes in the park. The Große Straße, Great Road, was completed in 1939 and is just over two kilometers long and 40 meters wide. Designed as a parade road, it was made out of granite in black and gray. It was never used due to the outbreak of the war but it remains in the park today. The final structure the Nazis built on the ground was the Congress Hall. Designed by the Ruff brothers, the hall was built to replace the older Leupold Hall and match Nazi architecture and design. Marking the entrance to the rally grounds, the Congress Hall would hold over 50,000 people in a large semicircle that was based off the designs of the Colosseum in Rome. The building had a diameter of 250 meters and was planned to be around 40 meters in height. The Congress Hall, though, was never completed. It was started in 1935, but was unfinished when the war began and supplies were needed for other things. Other plans for the ground included the construction of a new massive stadium called Deutsche Stadion, or German Stadium. Designed to hold over 400,000 people, Work on the stadium began in 1937, but never got beyond digging the foundation. After the war, the stadium was filled in, half with water creating a new pond, and the other half with rubble from the damage Nuremberg suffered from bombing raids. The other addition was the Marsfeld, Mars Field, which was to be a large field for military demonstrations. Planned to be at the end of the Große Straße, the field was begun in 1938, but was never completed. The field was turned into homes, which now reside over the old field. Many parts of the rally ground no longer exist. The Ehren Tribune was demolished in the 1960s by the German government, and the Ehren Hall was returned to being a war memorial for the First World War. The Leupold Hall was badly damaged in bombing raids during the war and was demolished rather than repaired. The Zeppelin Field Grandstand was partially demolished as the colonnade was removed. However, due to the use of solid granite blocks to build the hall, speaker's platform, and the terraces, the amount of money and dynamite to blow it up would be astronomical, and so it was left as is. The Stadich Stadion was kept and renovated to become the major sports stadium for Nuremberg. It hosted several Olympic and other major sports events and today is home for 1FC Nuremberg, the local football team. The Congress Hall was left unfinished and unused for many years. In 2001, a museum was added to one end of the semicircular hall called the Documentation Center of the Nazi Party Rally Grounds. It houses artifacts and information about the rally grounds for visitors to learn about the grounds. The order of events for the Nuremberg rallies altered depending on the year and how many days were scheduled for events. While the rally grounds were the center of attention, so many events would be taking place that the whole city would be consumed with activities and entertainment. Certain days were reserved for, cert for different groups such as a day for the Hitler Youth, a day for the Wehrmacht, a day for the SS and SA, and a day for cultural exhibits. Events also took place at night. The major political speeches, for example, would always happen at night. The decision to have nighttime political speeches was to create an atmosphere. Here, members of the SS and SA would march by torchlight and the use of spotlights created a more dramatic scene for members of the crowd. The rallies were spectacles after all. They had to entertain, wow, and amaze party members. Hitler would also use the annual congresses to present new ideas and policies for his regime. Often, he simply stated his ideas and goals in speeches, but in 1935, he used the spectacle of the rally to introduce his race laws that legislated against Jews. Hitler had the entire Reichstag move from Berlin to Nuremberg just so the laws could be passed during the rally. 
It was not that much of an inconvenience as most of the members were already attending the rally as Nazi members. Passing the Nuremberg Laws that, that legalized anti-Semitism was a major moment for Hitler and his regime, and doing it at the rally saw huge amounts of praise and celebration by party members. The most striking element of the rallies was the heavy use of Nazi symbolism everywhere on the grounds. The dominant symbol was the swastika, now infamously associated with the Nazi party. The swastika as a symbol is much older than the Nazi party, with its origins appearing to come from Hinduism and Buddhism. The word has its origins in Sanskrit, words for su, meaning good, and asti, meaning to prevail and has for thousands of years been associated with good luck, prosperity, and doing well. The symbol of the swastika can be found all over the continents of Europe, Asia, as well as parts of Africa. The swastika was heavily used in Europe before the rise of Nazism, as it had been a traditional symbol for good luck in Europe dating back to ancient Greece and Rome, who most likely imported it from trade with India. It was used by the Danish beer company Carlsberg on their beer bottles, while the Boy Scouts of Great Britain used it as part of their uniforms when they founded in the early 1900s. Hitler's use of the swastika came out of scientific racism in Germany and the search for the origins of the Aryan race. Many German scholars believe that the Aryan race had originated somewhere in Asia, close to India and Nepal, as such, many German nationalists who believed in Aryanism and held racist ideas began using the swastika as a symbol for their organizations. Hitler most likely saw these as a young man and took the swastika to be a rallying point for racist nationalism. The design of the Nazi swastika, though, was made by Hitler in 1920 with the specific goal of making it stand out and be easily identifiable. The choice of color, a red background with a white circle and the swastika in thick black lines was done so that it could be seen from great distances. The colors were bold, bright and strong, something Hitler wanted to project. During the Nuremberg rallies, Hitler emphasized the importance of the Nazi symbol, not just by placing it everywhere, but by undertaking a ceremony each year where new Nazi flags were sanctified by the blood flag. The blood flag was one of the most important artifacts held by the Nazi party and Hitler had raised it to be so. The blood flag was originally a Nazi flag carried by the 5th SA unit out of Munich. It had been carried by the SA during the Beer Hall Putsch when one of the police officers fired on the Nazi marchers. The flag fell and one of the SA members killed during the putsch collapsed and died on the flag, staining it with his blood. Hitler was presented the flag after coming out of prison and he held it as a sacred relic of the sacrifices made for the party. It was brought to the Nuremberg rally each year where new Nazi flags would be presented to Hitler. Taking the blood flag in one hand and the new flag in the other, Hitler would brush the blood flag over the new flag, thereby making it a true Nazi flag and ready to be used. The religious nature of the ceremony was not lost as it was treated with reverence and respect by all who attended. One of the key objectives for Hitler in holding the, such spectacular rallies was for party members to be amazed and return home to spread the word. To help spread the messages coming out of the rallies, Hitler and the Nazi party developed a system of disseminating their, in, their messages with the departing members. Each year they published new books and pamphlets that contained the text of the speeches along with a huge number of photographs. They made an effort to ensure they were in color as well. During the rallies, other books and souvenirs were sold to party members to bring home so that they could remember their experiences and show others what they had. The most novel method of getting the rallies out to the public was through documentary, documentary films. Organized and funded by Goebbels and his Ministry of Popular Enlightenment, the films gained huge success due to the director, Leni Refenstahl, 
one of the few female filmmakers in Germany. Reffenstahl had begun her career as a dancer, but after an injury, moved into acting and filmmaking during the Weimar Republic. In 1932, she directed her first film, Das Blue Licht, The Blue Light, which she also starred in and was the first woman in Germany to direct a movie. The film caught Hitler's eye, who saw Reffenstahl as the model of Aryan womanhood and found her filmmaking skills appealing. He met with her in 1933 and ordered Goebbels to hire her to make a film about that year's Nuremberg rally. The film, Der Sieg des Glauben, The Victory of Faith, was loved by Hitler, who made Reffenstahl make a second film for the next rally in 1934. The next film, called Triumph des Willen, Triumph of the Will, was a massive success as it is considered the best example of propaganda filmmaking. The movie garnered Reffenstahl international attention as the movie was broadcast in different countries. Reffenstahl went on to make a third documentary on the Nuremberg rallies in 1935, Tag der Freiheit, Unser Wehrmacht, Day of Freedom, Our Armed Forces, which focused on the army instead. Reffenstahl became close to Hitler, who was an avid movie fan and loved to watch her films. She also became close with Goebbels, though an underlying tension existed as Goebbels feared she might undermine his position next to Hitler. In 1936, Reffenstahl was offered the chance to film another Nazi spectacle, the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Her film, Olympia, garnered her even more international acclaim as it was broadcast by the International Olympic Committee to countries around the world. The film is considered the first true sports documentary and set the standard by which all sports documentaries are filmed to this day. Her most famous shot was a tracking shot of African-American sprinter Jesse Owens, who won four gold medals in the Olympics. Reffenstahl's work on the Olympics helped showcase the Nazi Olympics to the world and showcase the success of the Nazi regime. The Olympics for 1936 had been awarded to Berlin before Hitler came to power. Rather than ignore them, he saw the event as an opportunity to show the world the abilities and power of Nazism. Most Olympics before 1936 were highlights of sporting prowess but they did not contain the same pageantry or spectacle Olympics in the present day have. Until 1936, the Olympics did not have opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies, or the Olympic torch relay. The torch relay was introduced by the Nazis to the Olympics as a means of showing the links between Greece and Nazi Germany. They organized the relay of runners from Athens to Berlin, and it was the final runner who lit the Olympic flame. Reffenstahl filmed the whole event and since then every nation to host the Olympics, summer and winter, have recreated this Nazi spectacle. The games were also opened by Hitler, who attended the opening ceremonies and delivered a speech. Hitler saw the games as an opportunity to highlight the strength of Germany under Nazism. A new stadium, the Olympiastadion, was built in Berlin to host the opening ceremonies and host major events like track and field. The stadium was, pur was purposely built to highlight Nazi architecture with arches and massive stones ensuring it could hold over 110,000 people. At one end was placed a large staircase and at the top the Olympic cauldron and at the other a massive bell tower overlooking the city. The construction, though, of the venues was undertaken with little regard for the citizens of Berlin. Thousands of poor Berliners were forced out of their homes, as well as members of the Roma and Sinti populations who lived on the fringes of society. Many Roma and Sinti were taken to the concentration camps, while poor Berliners were forced out onto the streets and homelessness. By 1936, of course, knowledge of the anti-Semitism of Hitler and the Nazi party was well known. In the build-up to the Olympics, a growing number of Jewish groups outside of Germany began pushing for a boycott of the Berlin Games. 
It was significant in the United States where Jewish and African American organizations saw the Nazi Olympics as dangerous to support and participate in. The governments though refused to get involved and the head of the US Olympic Committee visited Berlin in 1935 to ascertain the level of repression going on in Germany. Guided by Goebbels, the American delegation returned with nothing but good news and that reports of racism were over exaggerated. In reality, the Americans had warned the Nazis that showing their anti-Semitic and racist policies would damage their place in the world, and so Hitler promised to remove evidence before the games. During the time the Olympics were being held, SS and SA members removed all posters and propaganda in Berlin that attacked Jews. They also moved Jews and other ethnic groups out of Berlin to ensure they could not speak to the athletes and other visitors about the realities of life in Nazi Germany. These efforts though were not enough to hide what was happening in Germany under Nazi rule to any foreign visitor. Athletes were able to speak to their German counterparts many of whom were not members of the Nazi party, and learned the truth about Hitler's regime. In the end, though, the leaders of the International Olympic Committee did not want to play politics or condemn the regime for their actions. The failure of the Olympics to act and stop the Nazi Olympics has left a dark stain on the Olympics as they promoted Nazism and legitimized the regime on the international stage. The lasting impact Beyond the buildings, for Nazi spectacles was the impact they had on those who attended them. Thousands of Germans became followers of Hitler and Nazism through the spectacles they attended, feeling a sense of community and importance through the power of mass suggestion. Hepke Remmer, a young girl from a farming family, described seeing Hitler at a harvest festival as, quote, when he went up the mountain, I couldn't understand how it was possible that people could shout so much. Yet when he came towards our group, I too came under his spell and shouted Heil just like everyone else. But then, when he was really close, greeting people to his left and right, shaking their hand and exchanging a few words, and he also shook my hand, I suddenly noticed that everybody in his immediate presence was completely silent." End quote. The outbreak of the Second World War halted the mass rallies and spectacles hosted by the Nazi party. The last Nuremberg rally was in 1938. The party was gearing up to host the 1939 rally to start on September 2nd. It was cancelled a day before it started as the Wehrmacht invaded Poland starting the Second World War on September 1st. Ironically, that year the name of the Congress was Rally of Peace, and the des designated festivities were meant to celebrate and showcase the peace that Germany wanted with the rest of Europe and the world. 